Um, my name is Greg Cote. I'm at uh, Oregon Health and Science University, and I'm pleased to co-moderate this session. Um, and I'll let my, my partner in crime uh, introduce herself here in a minute. But this session is going to be on advances in biomarkers, genetics, and uh, personalized medicine and pancreatitis. So. And my name is Ellie Afghani. I'm from Johns Hopkins, and I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker of this session, um, Dr. Timul Turkis from Indiana University School of Medicine. He's professor of radiology, medicine, and urology, and he's going to be uh, giving us a talk on imaging. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, uh, thank you for the kind of invitation and introduction. So I'm a radiologist and I've been working on pancreas imaging for uh, more than 10 years now. And um, I'd like to talk about what is uh, being developed in the imaging of chronic pancreatitis, especially, and, and what are coming down the, in the near future. And just wanted to give you a brief update. And we have several uh, NIH-funded studies. And um, I want to split this talk to three uh, parts. One is the rationale for a new diagnostic criteria, why we should include parenchymal imaging, and what are these imaging, new imaging biomarkers that are promising for diagnosis and follow-up of chronic pancreatitis. So start with a rationale for a new diagnostic criteria. There has been several papers already uh, published on this one. I'm not going to list all of them, but we'll give some examples. And uh, one point that is being made is the Cambridge criteria does not detect the early chronic pancreatitis patients. And I will just give you an example study that we have done. Uh, but most of the other studies uh, agrees that the MR signal, specifically MR T1 signal changes, are seen uh, in the early phases of chronic pancreatitis. Uh, especially the fact that it, it is uh, during the time of a normal MRCP. Now, these are the times that the, the pancreas gets recurrent acute pancreatitis and then develops into early chronic pancreatitis, but the ductal changes does not happen all the time. But the, 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 the MR signal changes can be seen. And here's an example study that we looked into the 42 patients with suspected chronic pancreatitis who was having recurrent acute pancreatitis episode, but uh, their MRCP was normal. And as a next step, they wanted to look into their uh, the, these patient's exocrine function, and they did uh, EPFD. And, and sure, 30% of those patients had abnormal bicarbonate or EPFD. So we looked at the T1 signal intensity ratio of these patients, and, and if the patient's bicarbonate was low, uh, the T1 signal was also low. Uh, so it was detecting the lack of T1 signal or lack of uh, less proteinaceous material within the pancreas gland. So we thought that this is definitely uh, you know, something that we can explore more. This was back in 2017. So <clears throat> another um, point that can be made is the progression of chronic pancreatitis is more readily seen in the parenchyma than the ducts. This is a study, a uh, very useful study that came out of the Dutch pancreatitis group. And they followed 25 patients with chronic pancreatitis for four years. And they recorded several imaging findings in, within the MRI and MRCP. And the, the parameters that change over the four years was gland volume, ADC, which is a diffusion-weighted imaging of MRI, and fat signal fraction. But the, within these four years, they're uh, ductal dimensions, irregularities, and diameter did not change. So their conclusion was that morphological progression of chronic pancreatitis seems to be primarily parenchymal related. I think this is not a uh, surprise to the, those people who does EUS. They look at the parenchyma as well as the ducts. But in radiology, we are still considered MRCP as the gold standard. So at another point, Third point is there's discordance between the ERCP and MRCP interpretation. ERCP was uh, established for, uh, I'm sorry, the Cambridge was established for ERCP uh, back in the days. And uh, it has been basically adopted for MRCP, but does it really work the same way when we are looking into the ducts? 
One is performed retrogradely, other one is not. And uh, one is performed under pressure, other one is not. So they looked at 325 patients. The uh, radiologists scored both MRCP and ARCP. An agreement of the Cambridge score was only 43%, which is not great. So there is no satisfactory concordance uh, when using Cambridge for MRCP. The fourth point that, that can be made can be made is battery internal observer variability is needed for diagnosis and follow-up of chronic pancreatitis. Four academic radiologists, fellowship trained at IU, Mayo, Ohio State, at UPMC looked at 50 plus MRCPs. These are these are high quality MRCPs. I was one of them. And our agreement Kappa score for Cambridge was on the 0 0.68. And this can be even worse if you are using MRCP coming from a you know, outpatient clinic or a smaller hospital, et cetera. And the, the concordance for the pancreatic diameter, pancreatic ductal caliber, or irregularity was even worse. And talk about histopathology. MRI biomarkers have better correlation with histopathology. We did a study. We, we looked at the patients who had surgery for chronic pancreatitis and the post-surgical uh, specimen uh, score was given, and we looked at their Cambridge score and T1 signal intensity ratio, and the T1 score was decreasing as the fibrosis grade increasing with a correlation ratio of 0 0.54, whereas the Cambridge score had only a correlation of 0 0.26. As the Cambridge score was going up, fibrosis was, uh, as the fibrosis was going up, Cambridge was going up, too, but it was not as good as it, the way to, that we detect with T1 score, and 0 0.26 was not statistically significant. So I'm not sure back in 1980s anybody did such a study when Cambridge was designed, but we figured this out 40 years later. There are three other studies about histopathological correlation of the MR imaging findings and uh, the, the, the amounts fibrosis score as well. And last point that I like to make is that it is about time, and it's been 40 years since we have been using this Cambridge score, and a lot of things have changed, but we still have not changed. We still have not improved that we are diagnosing and following chronic pancreatitis. So why parenchymal imaging? This is more of a, I think you guys will probably agree with this, but this is more of a message to my colleagues, the radiology colleagues, because we are still using uh, ductal imaging. There are several reasons, but the, the most importantly, we have to correlate the imaging with the pathology, radiology pathology correlation. And in the histopathology trial of chronic pancreatitis includes ductal dilatation and distortion, parenchymal fibrosis, and loss of acinar and islet cells. We captured the Cambridge, we captured ductal distortion with Cambridge, but we don't have any criteria for parenchymal fibrosis or loss of acidular cells and islet cells uh, in our criteria. This is important, crucial, if you consider that ducts are only 5% of the parenchyma. The remaining is exocrine cells, 80%, extracellular matrix, 12%. So by using the MRCP images only, uh, you're basically missing 95% of the parenchyma when you're making uh, or assessing chronic pancreatitis. So as a conclusion, we need a new comprehensive MR diagnostic criteria for chronic pancreatitis. So what have we, we have been doing? So far, I just talked about like an introduction, but let me show you what we have been working on for the past eight to 10 years or so. First of all, NIH formed a consortium called CPTPC, as you all know, consortium for the study of chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, and pancreatic cancer. There are several centers on this map, and Minnesota is also part of this uh, now. This is a longitudinal study. I believe we are in year eight or nine now, and we are almost finished with uh, recruitment stage, and we collect MRI, MRCP, and CT, on close to 2,000 participants. This is a massive, massive 
database that we can uh, figure out well stratified, well phenotyped chronic pancreatitis patients. Long story short, let's go to what we have found in the MRI of these patients. First uh, paper that we published was about T1 score. This is, by the way, on the PROCEED study. If there's a PROCEED sign here, then it's a PROCEED uh, result. We had 820 MRI and it controls acute pancreatitis, recurrent acute pancreatitis, and definite chronic pancreatitis populations. The beauty of this paper is that it includes all MR vendors. So it is uh, agnostic to MR uh, uh, scanner vendor and also agnostic to MR uh, strength. It can be three Tesla, 1.5 Tesla. We bundled all of them together. It's a real life, uh, very uh, scalable study. And we show that T1 score, as you can see, progressively and linearly declines as the disease uh, severity goes uh, higher. In addition to that, PROCEED study also proposed a new severity staging based on mechanistic definition of chronic pancreatitis. And we call it mechanistic staging of CP or MSCP. What we have uh, proposed with the MSCP is uh, we are not only using the Cambridge score, we are also using the patient's clinical features. Uh, pain, how many episodes, uh, et cetera. And in addition to that, we also add uh, calcification is present or not present, calcified or non-calcified uh, chronic pancreatitis. And we had respectable number of um, patients in each cohort. And then the one on the right column, you can see the T1 score was going down from 1.3 uh, in the control group down to 1.05. So it was helpful in making this uh, distinction or the disease severity. So another study that looked into the uh, chronic pancreatitis was Minimap study. This is an ancillary study under the CPTPC. It was funded in 2018, actually finished, and we are uh, writing the last papers out of this study, seven enrollment centers. These are probably not something that you have heard before, but these are in the imaging community. We know about what these are. Uh, T1 mapping, T1 signal intensity ratio, ECV is extracellular volume fraction. DWI is diffusion weighted imaging. AVR is arterial immunist ratio. And then we also measure the visceral fat distribution. T1 Dixon is for measuring the pancreatic fat. And then AP diameter and 3D volume was also calculated. So a lot of uh, data was collected. And we had to, these are what the kind of a new imaging uh, findings in the, or imaging techniques in the, the radiology. The one on the left is the T1 map, which is a quantitative MRI. This is a ECV, also quantitative. This is T1 score or T1 weighted ratio. You take the ratio of the pancreas to the spleen. We can measure the amount of fat in any tissue. This is diffusion weighted imaging, and this is elastography. T1 score is lower in chronic pancreatitis. I think we, we all agree on that one. Uh, we all observe this uh, finding. How it is calculated, the one on the left is a control, shows much brighter pancreas as you can see. You just take the signal intensity of this and ratio it to the spleen. If spleen is not present, you can ratio it to the muscle as well. And you generate a signal intensity ratio. We call it simply score, T1 score. The T1 mapping is on the other hand is a quantitative MRI and uh, it is kind of a new imaging techniques that being getting into the clinical practice now. And it gives more tissue specific properties. For example, what you're seeing here is actually a T2 weighted image. And the patient on the left is a chronic pancreatitis patient on the right is chronic pancreatitis, left is uh, normal. And as, if you look at the T2, it does not show a lot of difference. Uh, but if you do T1 mapping, you get more tissue-specific property, and that shows that you know the red dots basically indicate that the T1 relaxation time increases, and it gives you more data about the tissue itself. Extracellular volume fraction is a totally different, and 
If you never heard of ECB, it is being used to assess myocardial fibrosis for more than a decade now. It is one of the clinical practice uh, that is performed by cardiologists, more than radiologists, actually. So it is, I just wanted to transfer this data to the uh, pancreas because, you know, the both pancreas and myocardium are not biopsied every day. You need a, a non-invasive non diagnostic procedure. And the way the ECV works is it basically calculates the amount of interstitial space within uh, the tissues. And the, on the left is a my early chronic pancreatitis with a little bit of fibrosis here. On the right is a severe chronic pancreatitis patient. So the, the fibrosis increases the extracellular space. And we are able to detect this using pre and post contrast T1 maps, put it into a formula like that, and we generate an image like these. On the left is again Cambridge zero patient. On the right is a severe chronic pancreatitis patient. We are able to measure the fat content. Uh, as you know, the, the amount of fat increases in chronic pancreatitis. This is uh, everyday MRI images for us. Uh, you just put two region of interest measurements on the fat only and water only uh, fraction images, and then you put it into your formula, simply generate the percentage of the amount of fat signal coming from the tissue. Then we looked at all of these parameters both quantitative and semi-quantitative. This is, again, minimap results. And uh, diffusion-weighted images was not different between the chronic pancreatitis and normal, but almost everything else was uh, significantly different in chronic pancreatitis patients, so very promising. And we decided to generate also quantitative MRI scores out of these results. And we were able to achieve AUCs with up to 0 0.76 with quantitative MRI score, 0 0.82 with semi-quantitative MRI scores. And then we looked at all of these and combined the best imaging modality, best imaging techniques, and came up with the CP MRI scores. And we have two of these. The CP MRI score is fat fraction, arteriovenous enhancement ratio, and pancreatic tail diameter. And if there is a, a secretin, performed also, and we added pancreatic ductal elasticity, PDE, to that, and call it CPSMRI score. The performance of the CPMRI score is higher than the quantitative or semi-quantitative. We were able to reach 0 0.86 with CPSMRI score, which requires secretin, and then CPMRI score was 0 0.84. So can we use these imaging techniques today? Actually, you can. These are everyday MRI parameters. There is nothing quantitative, nothing fancy. You don't need to uh, buy any software. It can be done on any uh, MR vendor, and it can be done at any MR uh, sequence, um, MR magnet strength. The, these are the images that you need. And uh, these two are used for fat measurement. This is just to measure the diameter. And these are just enhancement curves. So the, first we measure the fat, then we measure the size, and then these measure the enhancement washout curve of the pancreas. CPS MRI score looks into the pancreatic ductal elasticity. So this image on the left is showing you the fibrosis. This is the duct, this is the fibrosis around it. If the duct is surrounded by fibrosis, you do not expect this to be dilated when secretin is injected and a lot of fluid is being pushed out. So we call this pancreatic ductal elasticity, and this effect can be seen on the MRCP images as well. So a lot of papers have been published already, and more papers are coming. But currently, advances in MR imaging biomarkers kind of look like this. We need a more stratified severity criteria like MSCP, and then we need quantitative or semi-quantitative numbers to match these uh, severity score. And then uh, one of these might be CP MRI score, which is a scale from zero to five. And these are the numbers generated out of the proceed and the minimap studies. Okay, so key points to take. Uh, parenchymal imaging features can detect chronic pancreatitis earlier and Correlates with fibrosis better than the ductal imaging.
what are we supposed to do next? We have a ton of data in the PROCEED study. We need to analyze the longitudinal MRI, MR, CP, and CT data collected uh, by that study. We need to give AI and machine learning a chance to help us. And then also plan a longitudinal analysis of the minimap findings in a future minimap to study. And that's it. I'm finished on time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Zilbeda Cruz Monserrati, um, speaking on, she's from, uh, she's assistant professor at Ohio State, and her topic is circulating protein markers of pancreatitis acute and chronic. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I love Pancreas Fest. Thank you, everybody, for considering me to give this talk today. Um, I don't. I. I, I don't want to disappoint anybody, but I don't have the answer at the end, and will tell you how you're going to diagnose a pancreatitis patient with circulating biomarker. But I want to tell you a little bit about um, some of the things that I have learned being a basic science and working with all of you clinicians, um, amazing colleagues, and through the CPDPC and what I have learned um, so far. And so we are very well aware, this is my interpretation of Dr. Jara's um, paper, uh, looking at the progression from healthy to, recur to acute, recurrent acute, uh, to chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer, and trying to understand the progressiveness of this inflammatory disease. I'm very interested in the biology, but of course, as uh, you as clinicians want to know which one is, which patient is what, which patient is gonna progress, and you wanna know um, in a simple way without expensive imaging. But there goes the clinic, and then of course, this is the figure that he, uh, he posed in the paper. Um, there are no good clinical biomarkers of pancreatitis aside of the expensive imaging, and even with imaging, we just heard that um, those are evolving because you're using old criteria. But, you know, we, you can, I think you do better at detecting severe or advanced disease, but those early stages or those patients that are kind of questionable, you're, it's, it's hard to do. So when it comes to, um, I've had to have a crash course on biomarker development, but when it comes to how to develop these biomarkers, I think we have to, having come from the cancer field and looking for uh, early biomarkers of cancer, in particular, my interest in creating cancer, we've learned from the um, early detection um, network in, in, in cancer, looking at, you know, rigor and reproducibility and how to work on this uh, biomarker development, these These um, uh, the probe design, which pretty much uh, takes into consideration taking an exploratory phase of a biomarker development, us in the lab looking at ELISAs, looking at omics, different type of omics, and how to get them from that exploratory phase to um, clinical development. And for I, we don't have such a thing for pancreatitis just yet. I think these are conversations that we're having within the consortium. But these model for probe design, uh, probe study design, um, which it's called prospective specimen collection retrospective blinded evaluation, um, goes through the exploratory phase, the clinical assay and validation phase, then the retrospective longitudinal prospective uh, screening, and then cancer control for cancer, of course, in the context of cancer. So we gotta have to think about how they have used this in the context of cancer and apply it to uh, pancreatitis. And so uh, early on during, uh, when the consortium was set up, we, we wanted to figure out what was out there. And so um, effort among, the different PIs was to kind of look at a, a literature review of what is in the literature in terms of biomarkers of pancreatitis, specifically chronic pancreatitis. And um, again, going through the different phases, um, 
we have realized that most of the studies are in the preclinical exploratory phase, either using mouse models or using small cohorts of patients um, that have some limitations, and I will go through those. So when we designed this, we actually went in the literature review looking at different search terms. And I, it is very important that we go through this because when we did the systematic review, there were some things that were excluded for um, good reasons. And I will tell you then in a separate review that we did um, how this, why this is important to at least consider when you actually read this study. Um, looking at terms such as pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, biomarkers, and diagnosis, but all of the animal studies were excluded. So no study that looked at animal models, unless it had human studies in the paper, were included in this review. So of everything that showed up, you see that about 509 studies were excluded in this review. Um, so then within the articles that made the cut around 234, then we had to exclude or we excluded data that did not compare a chronic pancreatitis case to a control, to a normal control, and those that only compare CP uh, uh, chronic to pancreatic cancer. And then um, also if there was no quantitative data reported and um, if studies were just assessing tissue immunohistochemistry because we were trying to look for circulating biomarkers. And so with that, we ended up with about 67 studies and then we categorized them into whether there was a large effect based on the area under the uh, receiving operating curve of um, higher than um, 96, 0.96, or a moderate effect um, between 0.96 and 0.83, modest effect that was less than 0.83, but had a p-value of less than 0.05, or no effect whatsoever, um, or, or no effect. And so among that, um, just to give um, all of those in the room, uh, what an AUC actually tells you is just the probability of randomly selecting a patient with a, well, have a highest test result than a randomly selected um, control, right? So you want that perfect qualifier where the star is at one. I don't think there's such a biomarker that will give you one, but at least it will give you close to it, or at least that's what you want, right? You want that positive, um, uh, true positive rate to be super high, and then um, you don't wanna be below that random qualifier of 0.5. And so what happened was that within the large effects, we found about five, the moderate effects, 30, 31, and 15. And just a reminder that we use this specific criteria when we were reviewing these studies. And then um, these were the five that had a large effect, right? And we get things like, um, uh, um, fatty acid oxidative, uh, fatty acid oxidation, um, metabolites, there were, um, adiponectin was one of them and IL-6, which a lot of you might be familiar. So there were some cytokines that were very interesting. But I mean, that's not to say that these are the five that we need to focus on. These were the ones that came up um, um, as interesting. But you know, you, you start seeing things like, well, this is the end number. It, even though it had a high AUC, uh, the end number was five. So, I mean, the data is the data. We're just reporting into how we were analyzing these papers, but it's just to say that you kind of have to go into the study and understand how the study was designed. And so some of the many limitations we found when we reviewed this was the large variation in sample size and the lack of sample size power calculation, how they came up in, in the study design. Um, the variability in the clinical definition that was used in the study that did not follow professional um, society guidelines or the guidelines that you all in the room establish. Um, the lack of phenotypic characteristics of the controlled or the CP cases that were used. Um, the lack of information regarding how many episodes of acute pancreatitis or the length of the time between the most recent episode and the time point in which that biospecimen was collected. That information was very hard to find in these studies. And then there was no, it was not clear whether a standard operating procedure for the specimen collection was used in that study. 
And then also sometimes neither the ROC or the AUROC were reported only means. And actually we, some of them, we were able to extract that information from the data provided. And those were done by the biostatisticians. And then the other limitation was that the benign disease control groups did not have were not used for comparisons. And so this was kind of like, okay, this is the framework of what we're getting based on what is published of those publications that made the cut based on the criteria that we used. And now this were, you know, proceed, um, you know, some of the long-term goals of proceed are to pretty much use as biomarker, uh, use it as biomarker studies for biomarker studies and also for biomarkers of disease progression. That was very important. Now, when PROCEED was designed, it was designed thinking about the probe design in place and a discovery and a validation set was set up within the consortium so that we could conduct the studies further on and be able to have a good cohort. But then if you go back to this, about 80, 81 total biomarkers were potentially um, interesting to move forward how do you decide which one to move forward, right? I think that is the question that we all think about all the time. And so my own answer to that is use what is known about the biology of a particular biomarker that you're interested. And here it goes, partner with the scientists that actually have maybe looked at that molecule in the past, maybe in a different type of disease, and learn from it because maybe that scientists have tools and, and innovations that you might not even think that they have already thought about it. Which leads me to the next part of this, which is a biomarker that didn't make the largest effect, but did make the moderate effect. And many of you might have heard it, uh, especially for acute kidney injury. Um, it's this biomarker called neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin also known as lipocalin 2, which is an acute phase inflammatory protein, which can be a possible biomarker of pancreatic diseases. Interestingly, this is not bias. Whoever initially, uh, Dr. Mark Topazium was in, in task of doing this study, he did not know that I was working on NGAL when the study of the publications were put together. Now, interestingly, um, it became a moderate. We published this paper the year after, but before, a year before we had actually been working on NGAL and its potential of um, looking at the possibility of using it as a biomarker of pancreatitis and uh, a very talented, oh, gave it away, very talented postdoc in my lab, Dr. Krister gomper -Fettis. She actually had went into the literature and look at every single study that we could find on NGAL and pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer. Now, of course, without the stringent criteria that we use for the consortium paper, but more into what was the disease that was used to, the biospecimen that was collected, was it tissue, was it blood, was it serum, was it plasma, was it uh, pancreatic fluid, was it secretin induced, was it urine, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see from here, it was like all over the place. Which, the, the, um, which, which kit did they use? What method did they use for detection? Also all over the place. What was the summary of the expression? And so you can go to the study and, and look into it. But again, it goes back to somebody's interested in something, we look into what is known, and then we realize that we're comparing apples and tomatoes and, and different things. And you kind of have to look at back and within the eye of how can we synergize all this. Among the things that we found um, were that, you know, it was a marker in acute pancreatitis of severity. Uh, it could distinguish from healthy to CP, um, but definitely a progression of uh, in PDAC, and it was elevated also in obese subjects uh, leading to uh, diabetes and the connection with diabetes. Now, our lab is very interested in pancreatic cancer, and not only is it an uh, increase in, in pancreatic ductal anacarcinoma, but there are other cancers in which it is increased compared to normal, and as we know, other inflammatory diseases. And so um, we published a paper back in 2017 looking at NGAL and specifically lipocalin 2 from a tissue study that we have done quite in the past and, and looking at animal models. But the point of this was that it was also highly upregulated in chronic pancreatitis, and we wanted to pursue that further. Moreover, in collaboration now with Dr. Kathy Vildorno, who's going to give a talk tomorrow, 
very excited about that, from Bartonville University, we asked the question in more detail, in chronic pancreatitis patients, which is the cell type that is actually secreting lipocalin 2? Mostly because um, we know it can come from inflammatory cells, but we weren't sure if it was coming also from different cells within the tissue. And we were noticing that it was coming from the duct. And so in collaboration with her group also, we look at um, single nucleus RNA seq from patients with chronic pancreatitis of um, databases that were published in the past. And notice that a lot of the cells that were positive for um, NGAL were actually coming from the duct ductal origin, um, and but also some other immune cells as well. So this gave us some uh, very interesting hypothesis-driven um, questions to uh, put together an application for a grant application. So what does this molecule do? Very briefly, is you know it binds hydrophobic ligands. Again, it's an acute phase protein with many function and it has potential for therapeutic target based on uh, what we think is this binding of transporting iron and, and fatty acid metabolism, iron homostasis, even important in the innate immune response, antibody production and the development and um, proliferation of TNB cells. And so we asked the question uh, looking, I'm gonna skip that for the sake of time. We asked the question looking at samples that were convenient to us at OSU and actually were able to recapitulate some of the studies within the means. The AUC ended up not being that great at the time, but considering this was a discovery study with samples that were not well annotated or where, um, and there were other studies that could um, look into it. We used those numbers to actually come up with a sample size to see what we needed uh, moving forward, and then uh, requested samples from proceed from the different uh, cohorts. In this case, we bulk acute and recruited into one, and then healthy and CP. And then look at this is the study population for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip that. But then this was the means uh, looking at, at the three different groups and kind of see that is very significantly upregulated in chronic pancreatitis. But then when you look at the AUCs, you see that we get an AUC from controls to CP around 0.77, and then from CP to acute or recurrent was 0.74. Now, when we then try to uh, compare this and adjust for age, sex, and other parameters, we're able to, uh, with propensity matching scoring, we're able to then stay within that 7.84a and then 7.3, um, sorry, 0.738. If we combine, um, if we take our NGAL values and we combine them with um, some of the clinical parameters, mostly um, driven by BMI and smoking status, we actually improve our AUCs as well. Now, interestingly, I mentioned to you that NGAL comes also from um, immune cell populations. So in collaboration with multiple people and many resources and using cyto um, cytometry with, for, for time of flight that uses uh, multiple metals, uh, metal label antibodies, we decided to label um, an LCN2 antibody and combine it with labeled antibodies that distinguish different type of cells and screen uh, the peripheral mononuclear uh, cells from patients with chronic pancreatitis um, and recurrent or acute pancreatitis and look at only the cells that were expressing NGAL. And what we see is an interesting shift in the adaptive immune, res uh, uh, immune cells related to an adapted immune response that kind of uh, tells a little bit or a possible uh, biology mechanism re regarding this. Now, interestingly, when logistical regression is done on, on the cells that were statistically significant, we can actually improve the AUC very significantly, mostly driven by CD8 positive central memory T cells and myelodendritic cells. And we're still trying to figure out what the biological significance of this is. Now, caveat is that we do get AUCs of 0.95 and 0.941, but I'm not um, screaming in excitement and joy because this was a pilot study. Um, uh, with small amount of sample cohort because the PBMCs are, this was early days of the proceeds cohort and there weren't as many PBMCs in the biorepository. So we're gonna, uh, we're pursuing that. So these are the AUCs. 
And then um, pretty much the things to think about um, as moving, moving forward is that when working with biomarkers of a particular disease, it, is, it has to be very clear what is the uh, understanding the process that is needed? What is the clinical question that you're trying to ask? What do you want to distinguish it from? Do you want to distinguish it with people from pain? Do you want to rule in and rule out tests? Um, you want to give careful consideration to the samples and the selection of cases and controls that you're using in your study. The time of collection, and the reason I mentioned this is that NGAL has been associated with acute pancreatitis in the past. There are other studies that have shown that, but in PROCID, we didn't see that. But you also have to understand how the samples in PROCID were collected. They were collected 30 days after an attack. So I'm not surprised if this molecule that is normally involved in an acute inflammatory response is not there. So that shows just to the power of understanding where your samples are coming from, that you're testing your biomarker of interest. And then um, uh, partnership with scientists that study biomarkers of interest, like I said, that are beneficial to leverage knowledge and resources. And then, of course, I have to give a shout out to Proceed, a great scientific resource community and a great investment by the National Institute um, uh, of, of the health by NIDDK and NCI. And thanks again for your support of these consortium. And then I, as, as of right now, NGAL is one of the first biomarkers within Proceed that is closer to a maybe phase two, but not really. We still have to do a little bit more of, of trying to understand that clinical question that we want or need to answer for these patients. So again, thank you again to the consortium for providing the samples and helping us with the study moving forward. Thank you to our pancreas um, uh, team at Ohio State who have been very supportive. And uh, thank you again to the team, our collaborators, our funding, I must point out that I haven't been able to get funded for pancreatitis just yet for this study, but I, I love the research and I love to try to move the science forward. So using institutional resources um, for this so far, uh, trying to generate preliminary data so I can get that grant funded. And I'd like to thank Dr. Christ, uh, Kristen gumper Fettis and Zach Hirsch, who are here, who have a poster related to NGAL2 posters. So please go ahead and talk to them. Um, uh, Dr. Kristen gumper Fettis has a very interesting uh, um, um, combination of looking at fatty acids as well. So with that, I am done just in time. Thank you, Zubeda, yeah, if you could join us at the table and both of our speakers are available for questions and well someone is hopefully going to help with them oh great okay i'll start with the first question um really for both of you which i think is a a, a perpetual issue in this field of trying to diagnose chronic pancreatitis earlier which is that we're hamstrung by limited gold standards, as Temel, you alluded to. So what do you think is the best gold standard when you're trying to evaluate a new imaging test or a biomarker test for chronic pancreatitis? Um, and does it re really require a longitudinal follow-up in order to make that call? Um, thank you, Dr. Cote. I think uh, the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis is, needs to be multifactorial. And no single test is going to be able to diagnose chronic pancreatitis alone with high uh, accuracy. And one of the reasons that uh, I'm saying this because uh, the way we categorize chronic pancreatitis is very simple. It's either chronic pancreatitis or no chronic pancreatitis. Think about liver. Liver has multiple etiologies for cirrhosis and they're all treated separately. But in chronic pancreatitis, we treat all etiologies into one. And not all of them develop the same way. Therefore, we won't be able to have a single test that will combine all of them and diagnose accurately. So more work needs to be done in the basic science level before we can diagnose it in a simple way. And so, so Beta, I guess the same question for you when you're, when you're asking the clinical correlation how 
severe does the chronic pancreatitis need to be? Are you using calcifications, for example, or the you know high score Cambridge to say this is a chronic pancreatitis patient, this one isn't, and how that could you know obviously influence the performance characteristics of, of your markers? Yeah, so those are, uh, I don't have the answer to that, but those are all uh, things that have come to play in our discussions as to how, um, as to how we want to do it. Because if for, so a particular biomarker is at a set, at a specific set of time of collection, but you don't know when that biomarker went up or if it's like, for example, if you do longitudinal tests in proceed, we're collecting samples yearly. But what if your biomarker was high for the that early detection, like six months prior to the visit or when it went down? Like we are, we're not clear as to when in time you're looking for a biomarker that will stay up all the time. That, so that you can capture at the moment of visit. So whether then you compare it with whatever the standard is, CRP, lipase, amylase, I mean, or, or do you take it, because we're talking about this, I was mentioning um, biomarkers in the plasma, in the blood, but what if you combine it with also a, um, a secretin or pancreatic fluid? Now we wanna go away from that so that we, we want a simplistic test. Uh, I didn't mention that, for NGAL, we don't see it in the urine, which is what you see if you have acute kidney injury, uh, right? So we were very purposely looking for the urine levels too. They weren't there. So um, I don't think I gave you a, a straight answer because I don't think there's a straight answer that I can come in from a basic science perspective. Yeah, that's that's a great point. seems like we should probably have symptom flare at the time of biomarker. because That's typically when you're trying to make a diagnosis and someone feels Lousy. Mice. Should we go? I, mice them first. Okay. I think. Um, thanks. Uh, exciting session. Thank you both for the wonderful and needed talk. So obviously we have much more work to do. My question is to Zubaida because we're still investigating the Engal in children and the story is still to mm -hmm. be told. If we measure it on presentation in plasma, Engal is elevated in acute pancreatitis way more than a quiescent mm -hmm. chronic pancreatitis state. That's plasma. Um, so I wonder from your perspective on the cohort, if you can comment on that, maybe you alluded to it in terms of the differences in the data because it's the reverse. Is that because the AP has resolved specifically? Mm -hmm. But the, the later part is, how do you explain that in the urine, whether it's your CP cohort, you didn't find it elevated. And the same thing in our cohort, the AP elevated on admission, we didn't find it in the urine. I don't know much about acute kidney injury and why NGAL is elevated in, and secreted in the urine, but I have to think that it has to do with the biology of where NGAL is being secreted from. So if our... Um, uh, if our study gets expanded on the buffy coat cells or the PBMCs, and we see that those are the cells that are getting secreted and maybe um, they're triggered by the pancreas, then that could explain why they're not in the urine. Um, so in kidney, it might be something that then gets filtered down into the urine and that's why they can detect it. But that's that that will be my possible hypothetical explanation of why we're not seeing it in the urine. So um, the day before yesterday, uh, Diraj Arif and I had a 53 minute discussion on when you transition between pre-chronic mm -hmm. pancreatitis to early chronic pancreatitis. And uh, it was very um, interesting because from uh, a biological standpoint, it, it's not one thing. There are multiple systems. Uh, there is waxing and waning of certain parts of the inflammatory process. Uh, you've got acute inflammation, you have chronic inflammation, you have acid cell recovery, duct cell recovery, regeneration, um, all those things going on. So it's really uh, probably a trajectory that's needed, but we probably also need to measure the different systems independently. You follow the uh, the glucose levels to look at the islet cells. You don't use glucose to look at duct diameter. And so uh, each of the 
biomarkers are marking a different process. And so exactly what Timbal says, he's, he's exactly right. You can't pick one thing to get all aspects of a poorly defined syndrome. You have to look at the components of them and be able to track the biological processes that those biomarkers reflect. And now we can start looking at trajectories and, and uh, severities and those types of things and get a little bit uh, better uh, understanding of when to intervene, what the intervention should be, and determine whether or not the intervention is effective. I, I agree. And, and, and just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that NGAL will be the one biomarker to use. I'm actually, I just didn't have time to talk about the other data we have. I think it, I, what I'm suggesting is that we find biomarkers that um, multiple biomarkers related to the different aspect of metabolic changes that are very specific to either acute or chronic. Um, in the case of NGAL, it just so happens that it's a fatty acid binding molecule and it regulates particular pathways related to even prostaglandins. And that's something that um, if you look at Dr. Kristen Gomperfetta's poster, she looked at some fatty acids as well in the same cohort. And we find some very interesting findings there as well. Yeah. We will be working on that. We're working on that. Michelle had a question in the back. Hear me? Yeah, Dr. Turkis. Um, I'm sorry, Michelle Lewis from Mayo Clinic. Um, we rely heavily on MRIs. I, I like your um, description of uh, your inter and intra observer variability with reading MRIs, as we've seen with EUS, uh, same thing. So two questions. Have you looked at AI um, reading your MRIs to see if that has less intra and inter observer variability? Um, and then the second point with your score, your MRI score, including like diameter of the tail, some measures that we might see normally with aging, with atrophy of the pancreas. Have you looked at a control group of patients over 70, 70s, 80s to see if your score holds up um, in those patients, uh, chronic pancreatitis versus the normal findings you would see in aging? Great questions. Uh, one question back AI to look into Cambridge score or either. Oh, the new score. Uh, no, we have not looked into the AI uh, yet. It's currently, we are trying to uh, hire a team in the CPDPC to do analysis with AI, see if they can uh, do better. And a uh, second question was about aging. That's a great question. We looked into the aging and effect on the, the, the MR parameters and published these results as well. Yes, I think the most obvious one is pancreas gets more atrophic uh, uh, over the age. We look, we measure the pancreas from age 20 up to 75, and it was getting smaller. It's part of the aging. Uh, but none of the uh, other thing that we look found was T1 signal is also decreasing over the, um, the decades. And that's probably because the function of the T1 is deteriorating, producing less enzymes, less um, hormones, and less proteinaceous material within the pancreas, and less bicarbonate also being produced probably. All of that was also affecting the uh, T1 signal of the pancreas with aging. All of these patients did not have evidence of chronic pancreatitis, of course. So yes, there is uh, effects of aging. However, these are minimal based on our, uh, you know, the, uh, the analysis over 300 plus patients. And so nothing compares to the damage or the changes that the chronic pancreatitis does. So effect of aging should be minimal, if any, and we are looking into these parameters. Um, I would like to congratulate the speakers. I thought they gave excellent presentations and Timel, I highlighted your work yesterday um, when I gave my presentation. So I, I wasn't here. I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's all right. It's unfortunate for you, but you, you'll have. To, you'll have to. Those are those are compliments that are hard to come by, Timel. Yeah. So, uh, 
Um, I but I think the, okay. the fundamental problem is, as, as David Whitcomb has, has just said, is, is uh, knowing what early chronic pancreatitis is. And um, if you don't know what that is, you're in real trouble because you will get a scalp or whatever it is you're going to measure. But if you don't know what that end is, you're in trouble. And people have got to wake up to the fact we don't really understand the biology of chronic pancreatitis. We understand different aspects of it, a molecule, an enzyme, two enzyme, three enzyme, one gene defect, that's it. We don't really understand what makes the whole thing progress. Um, so I would really urge you to, I don't think your approach is going to work uh, because you, you're, you're looking for what you think you already know that that's not going to work. And what if we can take an analogy from pancreas cancer, understanding the way that pancreas cancer changes with time plasticity, time treatments, it changes. And, and, and the main way that's, that's been understood to give indicators of individual biomarkers, if you like, is to look at the transcriptome. To get the transcriptome, you've got to get tissue. And you've really, really got to do this. Now, our friends at Cincinnati have taken out loads of pancreases, uh, many of whom don't have chronic pancreatitis, so that's a good one. You've got a good comparator there. Then some of them do have it, and it probably is early, and some of it is more advanced. I mean, people have really got to start looking at um, tissue in, in a more um, in more deep way, and maybe that will help us with this. Thank you. Yeah, we would love to have tissue. Um, yeah, um, it's split in a hundred thousand ways, right? Yeah, we, 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 I think, yeah, we don't have tissue of early though, right? And that, that's the problem because we can't diagnose early. You're not going to operate on early. Yeah, I think that 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 was that was sort of what I was alluding to earlier is the challenge of of the gold standard and and yeah, when the pancreas it, comes out, it's very uncommon for a normal pancreas to come out as a pancreas. Often yeah, but at Cincinnati, they're almost certainly taking out pancreases, pancreata that are normal from from people with chronic abdominal pain syndrome and so on and so forth. So within the range of the tissue they have, they will have a range of completely normal, maybe early possibly early, definite early, a little bit further on. So that's what you should th really think about trying to get hold of. And don't do a fibrosis. If I may make one comment about histopathology, there is a, a international consensus guidelines about histopathology of chronic pancreatitis published a couple of years ago. Please go ahead and review that. And uh, the, basically, we are in trouble because histopathologists saying that we do not know how to diagnose chronic pancreatitis either. There is no clear cut uh, guidelines about what is chronic pancreatitis, what is not. Uh, because chronic pancreatitis is a very heterogeneous disease. It is not just you know, the one, the, the pathophysiology that happens. There are several reasons that the chronic pancreatitis happens. And therefore, they are also puzzled. Unfortunately, there is not enough research and academic work on their side either to help us. But we need this information to better diagnose the chronic pancreatitis, better early diagnose the chronic pancreatitis. What we are doing now, all of us, at least my approach, is to create something that fits all. One size doesn't fit all, but we are trying it. What I have done with that CPMRI score is to cover the periductal fibrosis, parenchymal fibrosis, and atrophy and fat infiltration all together, hoping that that will cover all the etiologies of chronic pancreatitis. It's not, that's the reason it is AUC is over, not over 0 0.95, but that's all we have until we uh, accept the fact that chronic pancreatitis is not a single disease. It is multiple etiologies, multiple uh, pathophysiologies that exist that we need to separate. All right. Well, on that note, it sounds like I need to do more EUS pancreas biopsies. <laughs> so that's okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great session.